Welcome, everybody. Um, I should also say thank you for welcoming me um, virtually. I'm delighted to be here. This is really exciting. I'm always really happy to share the work of Rosemary Beck. Uh, before I go any farther, I should um, reveal the big spoiler, which is just that um, Rosemary Beck was my grandmother. So in addition to being the collections manager and the archivist for the Rosemary Beck Foundation, I'm also a family member. So I, and I remember her, I, I knew her pretty well. Um, and she was a pretty formative figure in my own development. Uh, I should also say that I am a, um, I'm a professional storyteller and I'm a performing artist and not a visual artist. And my background is as a scholar and a folklorist and, um, and basically someone who studies narrative very deeply. And I, as you get to know my grandmother's work, you'll probably come to understand how I came to have such a passion for narrative. Um, but it'll take a little, I'll need to fill in a little background to get there. But yeah, so I took a deep dive, um, uh, thanks to Colleen Randall, who supplied me with the wonderful images that you guys have of these paintings, uh, the Beck paintings that you have in the collection there at your museum. So I'm really excited to start my PowerPoint and kind of dive in here. Um, and I'll kind of go for a while with all this and hopefully we'll have a substantial amount of time at the end uh, for your questions, because I'm really interested um, by what you'll think of all of this, the art and the information, and it's, it'll, it's a deep dive. So here we go. This is where we I do the thing where I talk to myself while we do the sharing and Hopefully you guys can see that all right. This is the beginning of my PowerPoint. All right, the artistry and practice of Rosemary Beck. Is that visible mostly? Yeah. Okay, great. So the first question often is who was Rosemary Beck? Uh, she was known as Posey in her family. That was the family nickname. She was the child of Hungarian Jewish immigrants who came to this country um, around 1920, 21. Those are her parents there. Um, they were, they considered themselves to be very cultured as a lot of uh, Hungarian immigrants at that time did. They uh, had great love for literature, music, and art. Um, here's, I actually found my great grandmother's uh, grandfather's petition for naturalization. That's kind of cool. They did definitely become American citizens. And here's their first child, the artist as a baby. This photograph was taken um, about a hundred years ago because she was born in 1923. And not long after she was born, her parents actually took Posey on a trip back to Hungary to visit relatives. Uh, and I think they had they imagined that they probably would be leading a kind of a transcontinental lifestyle because during the 1920s, as you probably know, um, there was a big boom in America and everywhere and people really thought that things were gonna be really exciting, but the Great Depression hit. And that pretty much grounded them um, and uh, their lifestyle became very, very frugal after that. So they basically stayed um, in New Rochelle, which is where my grandmother grew up. There's her dad in the thirties, her mother with her baby brother. Here she is with a younger sister and a cousin. So this is the kind of, this is how she grew up in a small uh, sort of suburb north of New York City. And here she is playing her violin. Uh, my grandmother's father's dream for her was that she was gonna become a classical violinist. So she had a really strong <laughs> grounding in classical music and spent most of her young years uh, practicing, playing classical music, listening to it. Uh, and that was the goal. Here she is about ready to graduate from high school. So where did she go for college? Well, she went to Oberlin Conservatory in 1940. And she was gonna be a concert violinist. She was gonna practice hard. She was gonna spend her life in a practice room, play chamber music. And that was all going great. But if you've ever visited um, Northeastern Ohio and you get to the tiny town of Oberlin, you'll discover um, amazing museum called the Allen Memorial Art Museum. And Rosemary visited this museum and it changed her life and it changed the trajectory of everything that would come after. She left the conservatory and transferred into the college and became a fine arts major. And from that point on, it was art. And that was her life. 
She also took part in theater because she was a very theatrical personality and loved drama of all kinds. Um, and she continued to play, but it was art. Oh, she also scored a husband. Uh, this was my <laughs> grandfather, late writer, Robert Phelps, who was also, he was actually a, a local from Ohio and he was delighted uh, to meet her, they fell in love. And he was also delighted to leave Ohio. So that was a pretty cool opportunity. So they actually came back to New Rochelle together uh, after she graduated and um, she lived for a while. This was the family house. She lived with her younger siblings, her parents and Robert, but she had goals. So she would commute into the city. She started attending classes at the Art Students League of New York, which is still exists and is kind of famous uh, historically. Uh, there's a picture that I found, uh, some archival footage of what it might have been like there. And that's probably where she met Hans Hoffman, who was, uh, like her parents, um, a an emigre from Europe, although he was a refugee at this point. Um, like many Europeans at the time in the 30s and 40s, um, people had to flee. Uh, and her grandparents actually also in the late 30s uh, had to flee Hungary. Um, and they had to flee the, the Nazi regime that spread to that part of Hungary where they were. And luckily they made it out alive as most of the extended family did not. And so this household contained um, uh, her elderly grandparents as well. So it was a kind of a crowded scene and she got to New York when she could. Um, at some point or another early on, she acquired another teacher, yet another uh, European refugee, um, the artist Kurt Seligman, who uh, instilled in her a love of experimentation. And he himself was a surrealist and a bit of a wacky guy from what I can find. This is Kurt Seligman at one of his, I guess, famous magic evenings. It's called the soiree. It looks a little more like a seance to me. I see human bones and various things and uh, what look to be astrological symbols in chalk on the floor. Uh, in that photograph from 1948. So, um, and I could kind of imagine uh, my grandmother maybe seated on the floor with some of those other young folks uh, learning about the occult, astrology, art, what have you, from Kurt Seligman, this very interesting fellow who uh, was very passionate about surrealist art at this point, and he was very well known in surrealist and artistic circles in Europe and in New York. Here are some examples of the kind of artwork that he was doing at that time. Um, so my grandmother, who by this point was known in the family as Becky, so you'll forgive me if I refer to her as Becky, um, she started um, trying to do some experimentation as well artistically, doing a lot of sketches, trying out definitely some, a lot of her work from this time has a surrealist bent, I would say. Um, and figurative too, which is kind of interesting. And she she would take lessons with him at least once a week, usually on Thursday nights. And in return, she would run errands and that kind of thing. She didn't have a ton of money for classes. So she is usually bartering uh, for lessons and whatnot. And she did a lot of really interesting things. The, the issue was, and I, I love these, I found these actually um, in some of the portfolios we have in the Rosemary Beck Foundation studio, which is located in um, in right near the East Village on the Lower East Side. And there's a lot of older portfolios that are filled with sketches and things from these early years. And it's really exciting to go through and find some of these things. Like, Whoa! So she was in her very early 20s, a recent college grad. And she hadn't really obviously found her way into what we might call a mature style. She was trying different things, trying to see what, um, where she wanted to go. She wasn't sure. The issue with, with Mr. Seligman is that at this point by the late forties, um, surrealism was kind of considered a bit old fashioned. It was something that most of the practitioners of that, that time in New York that were known were, were on the older side. She was in her 20s, she was young. Uh, and frankly, this art was just, at this point was not on trend. Uh, it was not the painting of the future. And for a young woman in her 20s, she really, she wanted to know what was, she, she was looking forward and not 
backwards. She wanted to know what was up and coming. She wanted to be there at the cutting edge of where art was. And as it so happens in New York in the late 40s, early 50s, she was very well positioned. So for those of you who know your art history, you might be able to take a guess as to what happened next. Through a mutual acquaintance, another artist friend called Bradley Walker Tomlin, she met Robert Motherwell and started studying with him. And Robert Motherwell was very much the opposite of uh, Kurt Seligman. He was American born. He had a, a, a vision for American art, which was shared by a lot of up and coming younger people, artists, gallerists. Um, and he was interested in creating he, as I see it, he was trying to establish a new establishment of art. And it was a, um, an art that was based on discipline. It was based on methodology. It was rigorous. Um, it was about form. And this was immensely appealing to young Rosemary Beck. And he and his, for his part, um, it seems very clear from the evidence in the archives that he recognized her talent and he really believed that she had something. And he strongly believed that the way forward for her, as with most young artists, would be through abstract expressionism. That was the art of the future, and it was the art of the present in New York as well. Interestingly, at this time, when he was still fairly on the youngish side as an artist, Peggy Guggenheim, one of his um, sponsors or supporters, um, had strongly encouraged him to try working in collage. And so at the time that uh, Becky joined his atelier, he was very, very involved in collage work, really hands-on, very physical art, um, and all paper-based, essentially, cutting and pasting and mixing different media, a very experimental, um, playful seeming, but really play with a purpose, very serious business. Um, this is not like your kindergarten collage work. This is, this is all very goal-oriented. And so I found um, some interesting examples of the kind of work he was doing. And of course, he was also painting and doing really large, um, abstract, non-objective work. So when I look in the archives and the portfolios of the Rosemary Beck Foundation, I was not surprised to find some similar kinds of work that she was doing. So clearly she really, she took off with this. Um, and her art moved from sort of like slight little sketches and things to becoming really larger scale, very bright, very assertive. Um, it, things were really happening. And what was really cool also is I think Robert Motherwell was her the first person, the first professional artist who really recognized that, that she, Rosemary Beck, had a gift. And as a young woman in the 40s, you know, this was kind of, this whole art scene was kind of still very much dominated by men. Um, and so to have someone as prominent and well thought of as Mother Well to really take her on as a protege and really believe in her, um, I think that really, that was really critical in her development as a young person, um, trying to find her way. She was newly married. She had, she became a mother in 1949. Her family had very little money. She was, they were all kind of struggling, but this guy believed in her. And this guy was kind of a rock star in the art world at this point. So that really mattered. It really made a big difference. And he he was intelligent enough to kind of get her situation and he respected her and he really, but he understood like where she's coming from in terms of her struggle. And he was one of the first people who was like, you know, you may want to consider teaching. Like if you really want to stick with this art business, um, you know, and given your background, you know, consider that, but also keep painting, keep doing these collages. So she stowed that away. So she was living in Woodstock at this point. Her family, I'll get, uh, that popped up a little early. I'll get to that. Her family had moved out of New Rochelle. They were, the finances were kind of rough. Um, she had, a, it was a large household um, in Woodstock, a couple of tiny houses right next to each other, this tiny little village. Her father was pretty much supporting the entire family, uh, working in a liquor store in lower Manhattan. Um, her husband, Robert, there he is over at the end of the table, was struggling to write a novel. He had tried founding a, a publishing press that hadn't worked out. There's her younger brother, um, who would eventually become an eminent art historian and um, professor at Columbia, and his Italian wife. But they, the things were rough. <laughs> and they had a small child. And one of the reasons why they ended up living in remote Woodstock next to their parents was that her parents provided childcare 
for her, for their for her son, and that was pretty critical, so that she could get some time to paint or occasionally, you know, go to New York, have lessons, or try and find a gallerist. Luckily, in Woodstock, there were some pretty cool folks. One of them happened to be Philip Guston, who was basically her neighbor and became a really close friend. This is the two of them palling around at one of these kind of like dress up occasions that, that people would like sometimes just to be goofy would would have like themed parties where everyone would dress and that is a fake mustache I've been told <laughs> and Gustin didn't generally smoke a cigar he, though he was a chain smoker but yeah so they're goofing around there um but at this point she was very much in the 50s established as an up-and-coming young abstract expressionist everybody knew she was mother wells you know, protege. He was, you know, promoting her everywhere. He was pushing for her work to be in shows. She had works like this shown at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Whitney Museum. And like, everyone was like, she's going to be one of these, you know, bright young things. But she was sort of having an internal crisis. And at home in her studio in Woodstock, this was starting to happen in her paintings. And they, you know, they were struggling to try and make ends meet. She was teaching violin lessons. She was leading little art classes and stuff. Uh, she was even embroidering shirts to try and make money. She learned this was a Hungarian craft or art form that she learned from her mother how to embroider. And she started, you know, and this was in part probably from the influence of, of all of her teachers to, tr to be experimental and to move into different modes, not only on canvas, canvas, but also works on paper as we saw with the collage. And now here uh, we see an example of, of her work. This is an undated textile, uh, an embroidered textile, which she started doing uh, probably in the 50s. And then it became more and more of a regular occurrence that she would be, when she wasn't painting and when she wasn't sketching and drawing, when she wasn't teaching, when she would be stitching. And so it gets very interesting to see examples of her work there. But the need to make money was still, that pressure was definitely there, um, trying to figure out how to make things work. And she wrote, um, I'm putting on my archivist hat now, she wrote something interesting in her journal, her unpublished journal at that time. January 30th, 1954. In the summer, I had reached the critical impasse. I had inevitably to realize and accept the impossibility of going back to the freeborn, fluent, prolific state of innocence. Few past solutions could have meaning for me again. The idea of maturity appalled me because I knew unconsciously that to be responsible for my acts would be the death of my spontaneity. And I think that spontaneity she's talking about has to do with how she uh, worked in abstraction. And as she started to move towards, well, move away from abstraction and towards figuration, there is this, I think, fear of losing that spontaneity of, of uh, gesture. Uh, and that was a big crisis that she was going through in the midst of the 1950s. One thing that um, gave her a little bit of solace at the time, <laughs> she and her husband, Robert, got really into astrology. And I don't know if Kurt Seligman's influence as a surrealist and wacky occultist had any influence there, but uh, this is an example of, of what she would call a horror scope. <laughs> uh, she would make horoscopes for herself and friends or whatever. Um, and she was just, she and Robert got kind of almost obsessive about this, trying to figure out, you know, is it my moon? Is it my, is it the square of Neptune? Is it the opposition of Pluto? Ah, why are we like this? Why is, ah, you know, and so they did a, they did a lot of that and they talked a lot about it. Um, and she, she has a few funny things to, to say. Um, in 1956, she said, astrology seems so far only to confirm what one already knows. And therefore our life, which we cannot escape, has to be displaced by the thing we make. That's interesting. Um, and then she wrote, astrology is delightful because it gives a poetry to self-discovery. It purifies it. Um, and so she and Robert went back and forth with these horoscopes. And Jennifer Samet, who is a, a marvelous uh, historian and writer and really intelligent on a lot of these issues, wrote in 2013, Beth was also deeply interested in astrology 
and intended to represent all 12 signs and 12 houses of the wheel of the horoscope but that is in painting. She, had, she planned out a whole series of artworks that were all going to be based on the 12 astrological houses. But, she said, she got stuck on the house of Venus. What interested her was not just the romance or the sex, but the spectrum of Venus, the passion and sensuality that fuels art making, words, music. I thought that was a pretty good way to express sort of what her next moves were going to be. So House of Venus, um, now that she, she was still um, on the surface, at least, or publicly in New York, she was known as uh, an abexer. She was still abstract expressionist. She was still studying with Motherwell. He still was trying to promote her shows, uh, her work and shows, well, her, her abstract expressionist work. Um, and so here, you know, this is the first work that I could find um, in the archives, in her collection, that she specifically labels House of Venus. And she calls it House of Venus V. That indicates that there was a one, two, three, and four, and maybe others. And it's a collage. She was definitely still um, using that modality, that methodology. It was serving her well. Um, and kind of planning for it. Here's another, here's a letter uh, Robert Motherwell is writing to her. It's like, oh, you know, I'm planning out this and that for you. And you know, he, he was really excited about her future uh, doing this kind of painting. So this is the uh, a House of Venus that she did. It's a pretty large scale work. It's about 52 by 38 inches from 1955. So this was going to be part of this astrological cycle having to do with the House of Venus. And she did a collage here. This is actually currently on show at uh, Hollis Taggart Gallery over in Chelsea um, in New York City right now. It's part of a group show um, of um, abstract ex expressionist and all sorts of different work that was going on in New York at that time. So that's a pretty, they gave me this picture and I just love that. And it made me think of some of Mother Will's as well. But then there was also this. <laughs> I don't know if she showed this to Mother Well or not. This is also clearly, to me, this seems like in the House of Venus line of work. Um, and you'll see what I mean as we get deeper into House of Venus and later iterations. This is only her first, as I call it, her first iteration that she called House of Venus. And it was from the mostly from the early 50s. Then after she had, she went through a kind of a, she sort of came out the other side of her artistic crisis. And she basically, at this point, committed to figurative work. Um, and once she had started going in that direction, the paintings and the sketches, everything just started pouring forth. And so she kind of did a reboot. And she started what I think of as the second iteration of House of Venus. She didn't disavow any of her previous work, but she sort of, she rebooted. And what's really cool is that she still is using the methodology that she, that had been instilled in her by, by her teachers. So she was still experimenting. She was still working in different media. She was trying different iterations of things. Um, and she was taking this theme as kind of as far as she could go. Um, still very much grounded um, in her brushwork with a lot of uh, expressionist style. Um, my husband loves the early Abex work, and he says that if you squint and look at this work just so, you can kind of read it as abstract, which I think is kind of neat. But the, you know, the objects are coming through. I mean, you, when you look at it and in, in, when you don't squint and really stare, you'd start to really see things. So this is this is a real big one. And the other thing that's interesting, at this point, by the late 50s, she was no longer studying with Motherwell. In fact, she wasn't studying with anyone. She has kind of emerging now, I think, into her own mature style, but she still had a lot to learn and she knew that. And so she kind of adopted as her teachers, um, whom she called the old masters. And it's at this point in her life, I would say she might have said that she was kind of studying with Botticelli. He, she was like maybe taking a course with him 
um, in a kind of a, in an indirect sort of way. Most of her access to the old masters was through reproductions, um, you know, maybe going to the Met or places like that, going to different exhibits, um, looking at old black and white pictures and things like that of artwork um, and trying to figure out how did they do this? How did this work? How do I do it? You know, try and try out this way, move it here, that, this, that, and the other. Um, but she's combining all of these different elements. She still has the astrological idea in mind and, and the idea of Venus. And that was something that really was very important to her um, because for her, the idea of House of Venus it encompassed everything that was artistic, beautiful, meaningful, aesthetic, and but uh, they were also needed to be personal and referential elements. So it couldn't be just sort of like an abstract, like, you know, whatever is beautiful in that. It had to be something that was beautiful to her. It was personal. It was her vision as an artist and as an individual. And that's probably why she um, always made sure that there was a violin in there. Her music was still really an important part of her life. Elements of of beauty, um, still life arrangements that she studied so carefully in reproduction. Um, she got really into oranges and apples. Um, and then this painting that was embedded. And actually, this is one of these wonderful stories I love as an archivist. I was contacted by a former student of hers whose parents had acquired a, one of these House of Venus sketches. And this is the one here. It's the painting, the Botticelli painting in there he didn't know what it was I didn't know what it was it's cut off but as soon as I saw this image I went wait I know that lady <laughs> and he and I did a little research thank you professor google and we figured okay this is what she had been studying this is what she was working on and that's what she had kind of embedded in her own painting kind of almost cubist just placement with all these other different referential items that were significant to her. So House of Venus. Uh, so time went by, um, 35 years. She started a teaching career. Uh, she started working at Vassar um, and she uh, was, at the same time that she was learning a lot of these, these materials, being self-taught, she was teaching a lot of it. She talked about the importance of collage, of drawings, paintings, um, continued to study with the old masters. Um, she went through tons of narrative cycles. She tried, she, the, the, on the astrological bed, she did a house of Mercury, a house of Neptune, a house of the sun. I mean, and then that petered out, but then she moved into other areas. She got into, uh, Greek myth. She did a whole cycle on the Tempest uh, by Shakespeare. She did Orpheus. She, so this, and she had an extensive teaching career. She taught at Vassar, Middlebury, um, Parsons. Then she was at Queens for a long time. She retired from Queens. But then in the 90s, she was like, ah, I need to get back to teaching. So she started teaching in her 70s at the New York Studio School. Um, and she was living in uh, the East Village, uh, where she moved in the 60s. And um, I don't know why, but for some reason, well, she had long been, before I get to that point, she still maintained her interest in learning through um, still life, that that she had picked up in the 50s or earlier. This is an example. She had gone on a trip to Holland in 1973, and she would take her sketchbook in the museum, and she would see, in this case, a still life by Chardin, and she'd go real fast. I got tons and tons of these sketchbooks filled with these little quickies. But she was continually, even when she would do narrative cycles with Orpheus and all this other thing and a lot of storytelling, she would still recur every so often, almost like as a discipline or a, a reboot to still life um, and some of these old master style constructions, compositions. And this photograph I love, this was contributed by another student of hers who remembers her from the New York Studio School. This is a photograph of a still life setup that Rosemary Beck created for her class. So they, they would all troop in every day and be like, what's she gonna do today? Well, so she set this whole thing up and said, all right, work on this. This is what we're gonna do this week. 
and they would all work from this still life. And they would all come up with different things, and that's great, but she was still very, like, she believed in this format always as something to recur to as a kind of a discipline. And she'd also been stitching this entire time as well. Whenever she wasn't painting or sketching or teaching, she was stitching. So again, I don't know why, but right around this time, she decided after 35 years that she was going to go back to House of Venus, that she wanted to revisit all those themes that she had worked on in the 50s. So, and now we get to Dartmouth. <laughs> Because this, if you guys look over, you'll see you have the actual thing. I've got this wonderful di digital image, which I love, but feel free to take a good look because that's, that's the one. And it has all of these elements. It has so many elements. It's almost dizzying. It's a little overwhelming to look at, more so than many of her paintings. Sometimes I look at this thing, when I, when I first looked, especially, I thought, whoa, it's a little crowded almost there's there's so much in here but everything is has meaning everything is there for a purpose everything plays a part and um and she didn't just pop this out in one go she followed the old methodology that she'd been using successfully all along and you guys have some of these as well every element of this painting can be broken down or rather could be created separately and then reassembled. You could, the painting in a sense, the large piece, House of Venus, is a kind of a collage in paint. It's created out of all these elements that each on their own are and can be their own thing, their own world, their own work of art. And they each have meaning. Um, but then assembled, it's like, it's kind of like taking all the elements or the instruments of an orchestra and then putting them together in a symphony. Each one can play on their own beautifully. Um, and each one requires their own practice. And that's exactly what she did. So just to, at random, I thought, okay, let's, let's start with that figure in the middle, which is like this little sort of statuette. Also, forgive me, please. I, um, most of these artworks that I'm showing are not to scale. So these little, these smaller sketches on either side that I'm showing on the Zoom are not as large as the, as the big house of Venus, but I have sort of blown them up so you can see detail. I added, added this uh, study still life on the right of my Zoom screen because this is from our collection. And I feel that it's, it's very much part of this series and this work that she did at this time um, that relates to this particular painting. So I thought it would be kind of neat to compare. It's almost pointillist. And so those lessons that she learned early from Kurt Seligman um, and Robert Motherwell about experimenting, trying things in different ways, turn it around, move it, different strokes, different this, different composition, different coloration, everything, different media. Um, try it all, work it out. Um, <laughs> My grandmother used to say that that she couldn't even write a shopping list without first making several drafts. She needed she always needed multiple attempts to get to where she was going. Let's see. And she was also at the time also working on different series and different items and had different things that she had in mind that she was going to work on later as well. So a lot of her different series relate to each other and you see overlapping motifs and elements. Um, so you, you start seeing more and more connections with more and more work of hers. Now here's what's really cool. This is a photograph taken um, in our in a studio space where we have all of our her archival images and um, her artwork. I found this little statuette. And it turns out she, we believe that she made this, that she modeled it out of um, some kind of a modeling clay. And this little statuette recurs in a number of her later works. And I think that may be what, um, what is being used as a centerpiece in this painting and that she may have worked on that for a while. When you start looking around her studio, you'll see, you'll see some, some of these photographs, you realize that she had a bunch of these little things that she created and she would set up for herself. 
and draw and paint from. And of course she was still stitching. So that's, and of course that's just one element. The other big thing that of course struck me was this painting in the left quadrant, the painting within a painting. Um, and you know, I'm not an art historian and I looked at that and thought, oh gosh, what, what is that? It's something, it's gotta be something. Um, and I think really had a little assist. Uh, and we can also take a look at some of the other, the sketches that she did called after Watteau. So that was a clue I thought, okay, Watteau, right? This is another sketch version that she did. And um, this is actually at Middlebury College, this particular one. She wrote, I'm tickled that Middlebury College bought my little Watteau transcription. Would that it were all mine. So that was, she sort of getting at her indebtedness. So finally, thank you again, Professor Google. Here is, this is the, the quote, the original. Um, she sometimes called this painting Gilles, it's better known as Pierrot by Watteau from 1718 to 19. And she probably knew this painting in reproduction and she decided, I'm gonna put this in my painting um, as sort of an example of something that she'd been studying, thinking about, you know, this is her latest sort of teacher, old master. And she decided for the House of Venus, I'm gonna put this guy in because it, it's, it meant something to her in, in the way of aesthetics, learning, art, all these things that are sort of under what she thought of as kind of the house or aegis of Venus. Uh, but it kind of it goes further than that. So at the same time around about that she was working on this iteration of House of Venus, she was also doing self-portraits and she recurred to self-portraits throughout her entire career. We, we have many, many self-portraits. When you're frugal, when you're raised in the Great Depression, you you know you learn lessons about you know doing things on the cheap where you need be. And if you can't afford a model, look in the mirror because you always have a free model when you look in the mirror. And so she did a lot of that, um, and that's a big portion. So now me not being an artist, I look at this and I think, oh okay, you know, it's that, you know I I didn't catch the connection at first, but there is actually a, a connection to. Watteau here and I got it when I was looking at another um another journal entry of hers and this was actually from a lot earlier from 1975. Uh Paul Resica was a fantastic artist and a very close friend of hers still living said um oh I you know a self-portrait that she was working on in the 70s he said oh that looks like that Watteau painting you know the one of course, I didn't. I had to consult Professor Google. She did. Um, and this was the painting, the self-portrait that she was working on in the 70s. And Resica, with this artist, I looked at that and thought, oh, that's, you You are learning from the Watteau, aren't you? And she said, oh, gosh, yeah. And so then later on, she realized she said, I wasn't aware at the time, but now, yes, I think of it as an avatar with my latest self-portraits from the 90s. And now when I kind of pair these and put them all together, I kind of, and here's another self-portrait from 1958. And I'm realizing all of these do take something from this Watteau. And you wouldn't necessarily know it, and it's not obvious, um, but there's something of, um, of tutelage in there as I see it. Like he, she took him as her teacher. He didn't have any choice in the matter, obviously, but she took him as her teacher and she studied this painting and it resonated with her and it came through in her own style. And you would have to kind of know or catch some of these references to sort of see where she was coming from. But something else I discovered, so this 1958 self-portrait, um, so that happened to have been executed around the same time as that earlier iteration of House of Venus. And I stared at it for the longest time and I'm not a, a visual artist. Uh, and so I didn't catch it at first. But if you look in the upper right quadrant of that self-portrait, and she just calls it self-portrait. Oh boy, I kicked myself. So here's a closer view of this. I, you, can you, I don't know if you guys can see it, Mm -hmm. 
I have, was kicking myself the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, it's the Botticelli upside down. And she put that in the <laughs> mind blown. <laughs> so yeah, all of these things, I've started to realize how self-referential and how interconnected all of this thinking was and how there is there is much more method than madness going on. You can look at something like this and think, whoa, ooh, boy, that's there's there's a lot happening. Um oops, I just want to get back to here. Um but everything had function and everything meant something. There is nothing random going on here. And I maybe it was because I'm a non-artist that I didn't catch some of these clues. Sorry, speeding back again. But they all now seem very, very important. And wow, that particular discovery. So she, and I think this is also her way of saying that she identifies, identified with these great masters. I mean, and she referred to them as great masters a lot as a shorthand. And I would know that she would mean Botticelli or Watteau or whoever. Um, but she was kind of in a way saying, I'm there too. She was kind of, she was studying from them, but she was also kind of making an, a bold assertion and sort of saying, I'm an artist like you. I'm, I'm in your ranks. I kind of feel like that's what was going on to a certain extent. And that reversal, I don't know. Maybe she got a little, maybe she felt a little salty about the great masters in a certain way. I don't know, but it's just, it's interesting. Something to think about. There's a dissertation in there, I'm sure. Well, so there, this is another painting that I believe you guys have in your collection. It's another one of uh, the studies or sketches that she did in the House of Venus. Uh, and there's another painting, another one of these old master paintings embedded. Uh, you see it up in the right quadrant. This one really gave me trouble. Luckily, we have this in our collection. I thought, so like, okay, a little bit of clue. But luckily, this is another shot from the Rosemary Beck studio. And this is something that she had for many, many years, a reproduction, which is how she often studied, another one of her little figures that she created. So this, in, in her time, she would have known this as a work by Leonardo da Vinci. It turns out um, it's in the British Museum, the original. It turns out it's actually by another artist, Benvenuto Garofalo. Um, but she believed it was, as everyone did for a long time, it was a Leonardo. And so she decided to, to put that in one of her House of Venuses from this time period. So as you can see, it's a very, this is a very similar composition arrangement um, to the Dartmouth House of Venus. But she just was like, oh, okay, I'll get it instead of Watteau or Botticelli, I'm going to throw in Leonardo. And there's all other elements that she focuses on too. The so more and more of these studies, there are a lot of studies. If there's anything that I learned about her methodology, it's practice, practice, practice. Same as with her methodology for playing the violin. Everything needs to be worked out. Everything needs to be tried in different variations. There isn't um, necessarily one complete or final iteration. There's a lot of different ways to do things so and she was working on different types of still life at the same time as house of venus so she was continually borrowing from herself uh, and you can kind of see some of that here with these different arrangements in the studio there's a lot of um fake flowers and fake fruit so that meant that she didn't have to worry about anything rotting she could just kind of keep moving things around and that's what's going on And just continually picking out these different elements. Sometimes the, the musical portion is much more prominent. Other times it's the little statuette. She was already planning a whole other series at this point towards the end of the 90s with classical musicians in Italy. So you had a whole string quartet out. And this, this is the last little bit. She visited Dartmouth in 1992, and she wrote a little something uh, in her journal, which I just had to share. May 31, 1992. 
In the last month on good days, I breakfasted in one of two local restaurants in West Lebanon and White River Junction, high point of the day. The local people who begin their days often at 5 a.m., that was when she got up to get the best light. Uh, they're self-respecting, aware, bright, and good-natured. This is what we mean by American. And then off to my little motif behind the railroad in West Lebanon, which gave me a little rather tame view of the Connecticut River and two railroad bridges of you no know, intrinsic beauty. I want to see if I can make another earthly paradise there in several paintings, for which I will need picnic figures, fishermen, canoers, children playing, and a self-portrait. So I don't know if you guys know of any good diners in West Lebanon that are open by 5 a.m. I found one called Sheryl's and I was looking on Google Maps and I found that if you go behind, yeah, do you guys know this one? So like if you, and this may be trespassing, so please don't say that I sent you, don't get in trouble. But it, it looks like it, there's like a little place called Railroad Avenue near there. And if you go back there and trespass, in a certain view, you can kind of get two views of two different railroad bridges. And I found this sketch of her. Oh, man. So this was a motif that she really liked. So <laughs> it's it's up for grabs now. It's anyone's motif. So so that's uh, that's what I got. I'm going to stop sharing. And yeah, hopefully anybody has questions about yeah um thanks so much thank you so much for this talk can you hear us let's see if i can i just want to i want to get back to my regular screen did i succeed in getting back to my to the screen or did i oh stop share there we go i figured it out mm -hmm. ah, so that's the, that's the end of my portion of it. Oh, are you guys muted? Hmm. Oh, I hear you. Great. Cool. So I threw a lot of information out at you guys. That's a lot. Um, and I would love to get your responses and also your questions, because I'm sure there are things that I didn't think of or didn't notice. Um, and I would love to answer any questions or, or hear your remarks. Can they hear us? Can you hear us, Doria? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that talk. Your grandma. Oh, you're oh. very welcome. I'm glad to share. You know, I'm a professional storyteller, so like talking is kind of my modality, the way painting was hers. So yeah. Well, I used to live in Lebanon and I went to a lot of diners. Um, and the one that that painting that view reminds me of is actually near Four Aces. Cause that one's right on the Connecticut. She also is a little bit further um, into near West Lab. Um, So I'm, I'm not sure. It's possible. Four Aces has also been around for a long time and they're also open very early, but they're both great diners. <laughs> Neat. Cool. Okay. Yeah. A lot of what I do is trying to retrace her steps. Mm -hmm. um, not just topographically, but painterly. But yeah, it is kind of fun. Um, and oh my gosh, Professor Google is like, oh. <gasps> my lord and savior and everything so yeah um, oh, yes the the main house of venus like you're saying that she got really into like astrology and then like she kept like using that name like why did she use that name for like those paintings that's such a good question i think that um the idea of house of venus is kind of a great just sort of general enough um sort of I don't quite want to say a catch-all but it's it's something that can hold a lot because it's it's referential like people hear the word Venus and they think oh you know oh that they start to think you know either astrology or mythology so that starts to open the the viewer's mind in terms of possibilities but it's also just vague enough I think that it leaves open a lot of room for personal interpretation, both for the artist. So it's room that gives her room to put in how she wants to interpret it. And she, she asserts a lot. I think as an artist, she was very bold. And she was basically, you know, she was like, this is my teacher. He didn't choose me, I chose him. 
Also, this is me. And here's a little thing that I made that's going in too. Here's my violin because I like the violin. I mean, like she's making a lot of assertions and she's, some might say she's presuming a lot, <laughs> um, but she's basically taking Venus and saying, this is Venus to me. This is what the house of Venus astrologically will be. That's what it means to me. But then there's also room for the viewer. Like, what does House of Venus mean to you? Like, maybe that could spark something in the viewer. Like, I could imagine another artist taking the idea of House of Venus and going in a totally different direction. And remember that she did, and this is this is really unprecedented for her, she did three different iterations of House of Venus. And they're all pretty different. I mean, the first one was completely Abex, because that's just, that was where she was at. Um, and then the next one was sort of, transitional like you know there's a lot of ways you could you could call it and then the third was as, as you can see right next to you so and she's again really opening the door there and basically saying this can really be what you make of it but whatever you make of it it has to the it has to have rigor it has to have method it, it has to there has to be practice 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 um, and it, it can't just be random. It may like at the first, when you look at it, go, whoa, there's so much going on, but everything is there for a purpose and a reason. It's just her purpose and her reason. But that's, I think that's the beauty and the power of being an artist. You decide, you choose, you have that power. And it's, you know, we don't always have that kind of power in our lives as individuals, but when you're an artist, you create reality. And that's what she did. Oh, I like that question. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, going off of your answer, um, do you have any suspicions why she chose the old master painting motifs that she did? She seemed like she kind of kept on going back to the same ones. He did definitely have um, favorites. Um, I mean, she, she has in, in the studio, we have like piles and piles of old books of reproductions, um, which is like, it's basically, that was her Google. Um, before there was Google, there were just like, she would just save up and collect books of old masters with reproductions. And I remember as a child, she'd be like, oh, look here. And she showed me a book of like Velazquez, who was another artist that she loved. She sort of Hook him as her teacher. And she definitely picked specific artists like Cezanne or Watteau or, and she would sort of go in and out of um, interest, like greater or lesser degrees of interest. Like in the late fifties, she was really into Botticelli. And it's not like later on, she was like, oh, I don't like him. But she discovered other artists whose work had meaning for her at different times. So she you know, it was like she could kind of choose it, this amazing freedom of like who she wanted to kind of study with or who she wanted to really immerse herself in. And she, you know, and I I don't know exactly why she would choose certain people over others. There, I mean, some some of the the people that she chose did amazing things with fabric and color and composition. And sometimes um in her journals, she'll talk about that and be like, oh the drape or whatever that, you know, this, like later on uh, in the nineties, especially she got really into Velazquez and she did like little transcriptions of his work over and over. One in particular, um, the weavers, I think it's called, where there's a little image of the story of Ariadne in back. She loved that painting. I mean, there was a Greek myth in the back, but then also in the foreground, there were these women, like a whole group of women working with cloth and fabric. And she was like, oh, love that and she was like a, completely obsessed with that painting and that idea and then she ended up doing an entire series of work Fedra um all kind of inspired by that to a certain extent by that painting um but it was also about women and women trusting each other the story that she chose so it's she would choose specific narratives that were meaningful to her and then be like okay this is the the teacher who I need to study for this work and then put them together yeah and and she would be she would like show her work a lot you know she'd be like you can look and be like okay so that's who she was inspired by at this point it was you know it was 
Watteau or Leonardo or Botticelli or Velazquez and you know she you know she you could be kind of thrifty you could even get some of these books out from the library or whatever and you could like pick your teacher pick your motif pick your whatever like trespass <laughs> anywhere <laughs> I didn't say that um and like find your motif or whatever you want to pick and so she that's what she would do you know long answer a little complicated oh yes mm -hmm. um hi oh I don't know which way to look but um I'm just sort of curious about your experience with her growing up and sort of um like how what did, was she excited to show you or teach you or um share with you growing up and sort of what was that yeah oh yeah well at the time that I really came into my first memories of her where I knew her best as a child uh, during the 80s she was working from Ovid's Metamorphoses and actually you guys have an example of one of those there I believe you have an Atalanta you get if you want to get up and, and take a look at it you can so during the 80s when I was a small child I saw these sketches of hers all over. I was never allowed to go into her studio. Her studio was always strictly off limits. Everyone in the family, all of her friends knew, you don't go to her studio. But she was constantly sketching and constantly making, there it is, yep, and constantly stitching. So I would see around her apartment things like this. And I'd be like, what is that? What does it mean? And she'd say, oh, well, there's a story. And she'd be like, okay, so, da, 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 da. so the story of Atalanta, Atalanta was a princess. This is an ancient Greek, as told by the Roman Ovid. Um, and she was a princess who basically decided that she didn't want to get married. And she told her father, I'm not going to marry anybody. And she was an extraordinary athlete. And she could run faster than anyone. And her father said, well, you're a princess. You have to get married. And she was like, no, I don't. And he was like, yes, you do. And she was like, fine. I'll marry, but only if someone can beat me at a race. And her dad was like, ah, crap. And he, suitors kept coming and racing her, and she would outrun them all. And then they would get executed. And so finally, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I mean, it's ancient Greece, help. Uh, and she, but, you know, it's like feminism, yes, maybe. So, um, so she stayed unmarried because that was her thing and she had her own passion. Um, so then, as so often is the case with these Greek myths, um, the only way to beat someone like that is to cheat. And a guy came along with the plan and he consulted the goddess Aphrodite, who was always trying to get everybody married. That was sort of Aphrodite's thing. Um, and Aphrodite was not a fan of, um, you know, women with their own careers, et cetera, et cetera. That got us, you'd need Artemis for that, unfortunately. So, you know, Aphrodite basically gave this guy three golden balls or apples and said, just throw them at different points of the race to distract her. And he did. And that's how the guy ended up winning the race and marrying Atalanta. He cheated. And so the, in this painting, she you can see her, she's running and this guy is with her. And if you look, um, you'll you have to search around on the ground. There's a golden circle, and that's one of the balls that he throws. And um, my grandmother painted a number of iterations of this painting, and it's always which her focus of in the story is this moment where Atlanta is like she's she looks like an athlete, you know, she's like running and like and this guy's like <gasps> behind her, and he's like whoa, he's throwing this thing, and she's trying she's catching the narrative like right at the point kind of before Atalanta is distracted kind of when she's at her most powerful and undefeated which I thought was really cool because that's not always the way Atalanta is depicted by other artists um so she did a lot of she wouldn't have called it this I don't think but to me they look like feminist reinterpretations and so as a small child I was seeing a lot of these. Um, Apollo and Daphne is another, a woman who's turning into a tree and and this guy's like, well, wait, can't wait. And she's like, uh-uh, no. Um, and she did a lot of those. And I was like, this is so interesting. And I realize now a lot of these are Me Too stories. So she spent a lot of the 80s painting those. And I grew up looking at these and studying these. And I was so fascinated by the stories that she sent me a copy of Dolaire's myths, Dolaire's Greek myths. 
And that started me on my narrative journey. Um, and I ended up as a folklorist and then a storyteller and all this other stuff. So that was kind of, that was the angle that I took. So she had an enormous influence on me, but she would also be like, let's just sit and like, and copy the little paintings of, of Velazquez. And, oh, and here's, a, here's an etching by Durer. You've got to look at the cross hatching. I'd be like, so we'd sit and draw together. And I thought, oh, this is so cool. No one's grandmother does this. It's mine. And, you know. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, this is a, a short question, but just since she was so interested in zodiac signs, do you know what sign she was? And maybe oh, yeah. Like, like where she saw herself in that whole um realm yeah she was uh she's born in july she was cancer the crab i'm an aquarius by the way very quirky <laughs> um but yeah so it's i kind of ironic actually that she was cancer the crab because usually cancers are much more kind of like home oriented and sometimes more sort of like traditional they can it's a water sign so very emotional very sensitive um very easily you know wounded but she kind of in her journals, I, you know, you sort of see how much she kind of powered through a lot of that. I mean, I think as a young woman, she was kind of conflicted, very torn between her role as wife and mother and daughter and granddaughter. You know, she had these elderly grandparents in the household, her parents, you know, her small child, her husband, who had all kinds of drama and baggage of his own going on. But on the other hand, there was her art. And she was just like, she would write and be like, oh, artists, we have to be narcissists. We have to, and she'd be like, I'm, she called herself, I'm a monster. I'm a monster because I'm not, I can't do these things the way other people do. I can't be a wife. I can't be a mother. I can't be a daughter. I'm an artist. And so she had to make some very, very difficult choices. That first teaching job um, that I mentioned where she was at Vassar, where she was starting to teach and she was also kind of working on that second iteration of House of Venus, where she inverted um, the painting of Botticelli. Um, she was living in, in Vassar and her husband and child were back home. I mean, she spent a semester away from home and her husband and her parents took care of her small child. And then later she got a teaching position at Middlebury and she did the same thing. She'd be up in Vermont and they were in Woodstock. And they would come and visit her occasionally, or she would sometimes make a trip down, or she had a show in New York. But she that was that was pretty that was a lot of the 50s and the 60s for her. She was the prime um wage earner in her household. It was very, very non-traditional. My grandfather really struggled with trying to write and this and that. And like once she started getting her teaching careers and exhibiting and shows and stuff, she was the one, like they depended on her income. And so she had to be, a, she was a working woman. This is during like the Eisenhower administration. It was crazy. Um, and she, you know, it just wasn't possible to make all those things fit somehow. And she tried, but it was like a constant struggle. And so I sometimes think like being born under the sign of cancer must have been kind of rough because she had, I think, a lot of guilt and feeling like, oh, I'm supposed to be at home taking care of my elderly mother or oh, my son needs me, or oh, you know, Robert is going through, the, you know, but, but, you know, then there's this artwork, and, like, nobody, but she's the only one who could make her art, so, and then teaching became an enormous, important element of her life and her identity as well, so, yeah, so that's, yeah, it's this conflict that never was solved, and in the late 80s, early 90s, she did a whole series called Earthly Paradise that I may have alluded to. And a lot of it is, it shows women and children in domestic scenes or just at play outside, looking carefree and happy. And then off in a corner is this solitary artist at an easel with this big, that slouch hat, that sort of um, Watteau sort of slouch hat on, kind of like lurking in the corner, watching, but outside. And that's her. Yeah. Oh, she'd be a hundred this July. Wow. Maria, yes. I, I wanted to just um, say I remember because she was a teacher of mine, and I remember in class, she, um, she wouldn't 
she would mainly call students by their astrological sign. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't remember their names. Well, she probably remembered them, but you know, she would be, she would say, oh, I was afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh she was always doing horoscopes for people yeah sometimes I, the, um like when she went to places like Yaddo or McDowell she would do retreats and things like that um in the evenings people would get together and hang out sometimes she'd play chamber music with them she'd get out her violin um but then she'd also sometimes do sort of fortune reading sessions and do horoscopes and it was always like oh you have your Neptune in, you know, more in such and such, and the eleventh house. Oh, it's no good. And so, so she was very, you know. She also her other nickname for herself was La Strega, which is the witch. A lot of drama. I think that theater element never really went away. Also. <laughs> Not a typical grammar. Any means. Kind of cool too. So yeah. Did you have any questions about any of the artworks um, that you that are in your room, that where the space where you're looking at? Um, if you wanted to, feel free to get up and look around. I know there's. I saw that there's like a sketchbook as well, but I didn't. I didn't know um, what the images were in the sketchbook. Yeah, over on the table. Hmm. Oh wow! Oh look at that. Yeah, those are sometimes really instructive. Those get very interesting. Just constantly working out all of these different elements just over and over and you see, oh, look at, yeah, all these motifs. I realized in my presentation, I mostly focused on paintings and, and um, embroideries, but there's a lot of drawing that's behind it as well. Sometimes if you see a large work you think, oh my gosh, how did she just come out with that? And the answer is what's around you here is everything took practice and sort of building up all the different component parts before they were all kind of combined in one really large piece. So yeah, this this is kind of cool because it sort of anatomizes, it sort of takes apart um, the process, which I think is really important. Any other questions? Dorian, this has really been fantastic. And um, I want to invite Bye. all of you here to spend some time um, and just look at the work. <laughs> um, and it's so, it's so rich and there's so much to connect with. Uh, the sources and what she's offering and mm -hmm. um, yeah what it what it means and what you see over time mm -hmm. I love that Dory you always all of us who know her work are always finding something new in it <laughs> yeah I mean all kinds of different elements and things and there's some things that are just mysteries and then other things where occasionally like if I'm visiting the studio in New York, I go through and I'm like, oh, this thing, like maybe I'll see a vase or a shape or something and go, oh, that's in one of, and then I go searching through all these digital images. So it's, it's kind of cool. I was trying to, trying to recreate and her steps. And I know that there are some people here who are going to be working on sort of like intensive projects that might involve like, like a large piece and accompanying things. And I just, I feel like having a chance to kind of like see her method sort of like taken apart in this way and it's funny because she would she never let anyone go into her studio while she was working but I think it's incredibly useful and instructive sort of see like all these intermediary steps because um it's you know it's you can really see how these puzzle pieces fit together and how like you can get a sense of her thinking and how she tried, like, ah, oh, maybe the base can go this way, or like, let's flip it, or let's try it point a list, or you know, maybe this painting instead. I don't know. Do I want Leonardo? Do I want Watteau? Or, you know, and there's so many choices. And the only way to know is to just to try it and keep experimenting. Well, all those early lessons that she learned, um, 
I think she kept them throughout her life and they served her well. And she's still teaching in a way. Her, her paintings still, we can still learn from them. So yeah. 